right, Chris Sims, NBC Sports analyst, one of our favorite guys. We had him on a year ago, and he was terrific. What's going on, brother? Hey, what's up, buddy? How are you? Always, uh, always good to see you, Kevin. Happy holidays, man. Hope you're doing good, buddy. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great, and part of it is I feel like everything is bunched together right now in the NFL, and there's never been more arguments like i've never i've never felt on december 27th which is when we're we're recording this right now that yeah. there's been more good quarterbacks playing badly bad quarterbacks playing well i just feel like yeah. this is set up for debate i want to start here right patrick mahomes yeah because i think both of us are we will ride or die with patrick mahomes i will be the last person on earth who counts out patrick mahomes and i had somebody the other day say to me hey are the chiefs still super bowl contenders and i said yes on twitter i had 30 people including chiefs fans it was just like on christmas eve being like you moron 30 people and it's just like why why are we doing this you cannot count out the best coach and best quarterback in football but it's gotten to a place where people see first of all we have the memory of goldfish we don't remember that the the dolphins lost the titans two weeks ago i mean this is just that that kind of league yeah, um, right. but i want i want to put it to you because you, you understand this far better than me what is the difference between this year and last year with the chiefs it can't be a juju smith schuster i know kelsey's taken a little dip in form but why is this offense broken in relation to last year chris yeah i it's, it's a good question right i mean the chiefs to to your point i still think can get to the super bowl i do yep. they got to adjust some things but their defense of course we know is top notch i think their offense has to come to a realization of like hey wait this is the better unit this year and we got to play through them and we can't run trick plays inside our own 10-yard line and do stuff like that, right? Mahomes maybe need to be a little bit more careful and not the gunslinger we know he can right. be, adjust that way. Now, why it's different from last year to this year? Well, the first thing is, all right, all right so the Chiefs, why are they struggling? You can't both be like below average or average talent at receiver and then have average scheme to go along with it. The offense isn't as good as last year, period. It's not. Eric Bieniemy had more creative ways to do things. There was more creative play calling, tying plays together. And then I think you add on top of that was something I was saying really a while ago. And Patrick Mahomes, I believe, like two weeks kind of said it too publicly. Bieniemy was the enforcer on that offense. He mm -hmm. was the guy that kept everybody in line and in check. And if you weren't doing good, he got in your face and let you know it. So there's that. Uh, of course, we know the mistakes as far as drop, you know, the drops and some big moments and all that's added to it. And then you brought up one name that I do think there's two names that I do think are different or that were adding to their their mm -hmm. success last year. Juju Smith-Schuster, even though not a world beater for an offense with Biennemi and Andy Reid and what they had there and a quarterback like Mahomes, his role was very influential in that offense. It's not easy just to replace 900 plus yards in receiving. And he was a little bit of like a de facto, you know, small tight end in the slot. He did a lot of the Kelsey stuff where he worked underneath, let alone he was a guy on a third down and four. You could, hey, he's covered. We could throw a back shoulder at him. He could do that. And they had McCall Hardman last year, too, before he got hurt late in the year. He certainly contributed. So I know they got him back and he's been banged up, but he has never been the same since he got hurt last year. And I think that's why the Chiefs didn't re-sign him and he ended up with the Jets. And then the Jets realized, whoa, he's not the same guy here. So we'll see where it goes. But either way, I think those are a few things on why the Chiefs have not, you know, uh, performed up to, to our expectation level. The enemy mentioned it. So I was at the practice where Rivera said, well, maybe he's being a little too hard on the guys. I was watching the commander's practice and I wanted to, stop practice. I wanted to stop practice and get, and get Sam Howell and Brissett into a huddle and say, let's get this going guys. Like it was just such a frustrating practice to watch, especially when you watch the Chiefs things. I don't blame the enemy for being that upset. Um, do you think that what's happening in Kansas city is the best piece of the resume um, for Eric Bien and be, be a head coach this cycle? Yeah, a little bit. I do. Yeah. You know, Eric Bien in your face. He's harsh. I think that's part of the reason he hasn't got a head coaching job. He's not political. He's not trying to play that angle with connections and yeah. and kiss an owner's butt and do all of that. You know, I think that in some of his interviews when he's had GMs or presidents or owners ask him questions, he gives the the hard truth and sometimes they don't like that. You know, so I think there's a little bit of all that that and then yeah, did Andy Reid get the success? Mahomes right. get the success, right? Which, you know, drives me crazy because I want to be like, well, Matt Nagy was there yeah. and they Doug brought Peterson. him and that yeah. was all that was yeah, that was all good. Right. So it looks odd. But yeah, I do think this is at least a nice piece of the resume for Eric Bienemy. 
and and just showing that they look they're not the same without me and I certainly brought some ideas and an attitude to that offense that they're missing this year and I think that's something that he certainly will be able to use now you know they haven't been good enough in Washington for him to probably be thrown back into the head coaching conversation this year uh, but we'll see where it goes I th- I certainly think he has head coaching qualities that's there there's no doubt about that I'm gonna talk about the 49ers, even though off the loss on Sunday, I think so. I still think they're the NFC's best team, and like two yeah. things can be true at once. Like they right. got their butt whipped, but they're still my NFC Super Bowl favorites. And I don't know right. if they'll win the Super Bowl, but I think they'll get to Vegas. Um, I want to ask you about that offense and how it makes the the answers easy for Purdy or, or whomever. Right. Um, when someone says Shanahan makes life easy for quarterbacks, what do they mean? Well, I mean, all right. So first, you, you, uh, you're right about the 49ers, right? This is different yeah. than like the Cowboys going to the Bills and getting blown out. <laughs> right. and do- that was domination, or the Eagles getting dominated by the 49ers, right? This was right. a little bit different. Now the Ravens made some plays, we know that, but I again early on in the game, the 49ers were controlling the game to where you were like, whoa, are the Ravens gonna be able to hang in here here a little bit? I mean, again, he throws an interception on the first drive. Yep. They march right down the field. The second drive, you know, they get the safety. They safety. march right down again and have to settle for a field goal, right? The Ravens couldn't do anything. And then the creativity of that defense certainly, you know, made some plays and and uh, Purdy got a little unlucky and all that. But I don't think I look at that game and go, oh, that's a butt whooping there. I'm worried about the 49ers. No, I'm not. The Ravens are good and they have some things that really match up with that offense. Now, And, and the Ravens, real quick, the Ravens, it's almost like the, even though it's unintentional because you wouldn't you wouldn't build a team to beat a random team in the other conference, but it's like the Ravens are built to stop the 49ers with the well, middle it's, of the it's field a matchup stuff. league. That's yeah. where a lot of people you gotta get over. It's not college football where we just go, <laughs> well, one will beat 25 automatically. You know, in the NFL, you know, when one plays 25, 25 sometimes because of the salary cap and things, could yeah. have a team and a formula in which they play where one goes, whoa, this isn't good for us. Like, if we make one mistake, you know, they match up well with us and take away some of our strengths and they have some strengths or we have some weaknesses and this isn't good. And that's why the NFL is awesome and why, you know, to this year, to your point to start the show, it's all over the place because of, you know, more than ever. But, all right, so – when you say there, what was your phrase you use? Like he makes it easy. How, how how does Kyle Shanahan make it easy for quarterbacks? Because one, he's a genius. He understands defenses better than most defensive coordinators in football. He really understands how to attack the rules of a defense, mm-hmm. and then he's not afraid to draw up a new play. You know, so many coaches in the NFL are so conservative by nature. They're just like, this is what I learned in 1997 and I'm going to keep doing it. And like maybe every now and then they add a new play. Shanahan, McDaniel, McVay, they, they have enough confidence and guts and ability to think outside the box. Well, they're outside the box where they'll just go, I've never seen anybody do this, but I think it's going to work and I'm awesome. And I'm going to call it at some point during the game. Cause I think they're going to play this defense and so be it. So I think there's all of that that plays into this, let alone he also, and like we're seeing too with most of the best offenses in football, they can run the football. That's another thing. But when they make the game easy, yes, like think about the Cardinals game a few weeks ago. I mean, Christian McCaffrey is so open that that Brock Purdy could throw him a ball that he has he can fall on the ground, get up, and still nobody touches him as he runs into the end zone 40 yards down the field right? That's where he makes the game easy. He basically boils it down to the quarterback of just like, hey, read this guy. And if this guy moves that way, hit him. And if he goes that way, then hit him. But I've set you up for a success here with how I've called the plays, putting them in a bind with, you know, how I tie plays together and all that. And that's where he makes it easy. So that's where the conversation with Brock Purdy is really interesting, Kevin, because, you know, if we go by the normal quarterback on the best team type of thing which I don't love yeah Purdy's very much up there and then he has the least amount of pass attempts in football but like what second in yards only behind Mm -hmm. Tua that's a good thing but I also go that's also a Shanahan thing we watch the highlights every week there's people catching the ball for the 49ers you watch Brock Purdy highlights and go there's nobody in the screen or he can have games where it's McCaffrey over here, Debo over here, and we go, yeah. well, he didn't even throw the ball behind, over the line of scrimmage, and he's got 150 yards passing, and he hasn't thrown the ball past the line of scrimmage yet. 
So that's where Shanahan makes the game, you know, incredibly easy for a quarterback. And that's why he's the best offensive mind in the game right now. I completely agree. I was going to ask a, a question on top of that, but uh, people say, oh, well, you know, he just has the best player. So his scheme works. Well, who, who put the, who put the team together? Kyle Shanahan did along with John right. Lynch. So right. but he's responsible for all of this. So I was going to ask you, men- you mentioned that she thinks Shanahan is the best offensive mind in football because what's interesting to me is how everybody adapts their offense to themselves once they get a head coaching job. So obviously McVay is going to put flourishes on his playbook. Matt LaFleur certainly has, especially with Aaron yep. Rodgers' influence when he was there, Mike McDaniel. Who has the best playbook in football right now? Yeah, I'm 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 still going to go Shanahan there. I am. You know, Shanahan's the most creative run game designer in football. Yeah. He's the most creative play action pass designer in football, and he's the most creative screenplay gadget reverse guy in football, right? I, I listen, I I know Kyle Shanahan's my friend, but uh, you know, you kind of said one name to me right now. I mean, Kyle Shanahan, for my money, is the best coach in football. I don't think it's close. I think Andy Reid's the only one there in the conversation. And yeah. Shanahan just needs a Super Bowl next to his name for, I think, everybody to realize that. But, I mean, we're on the cusp of maybe him going to four out of five NFC championship games and, and doing that. Um, so, yeah, that's where – I'm going to go with Shanahan, but let me throw some other names that I think are, Please. you know, worthy of being in that conversation, right? Um, I think, you know, Mike McDaniel, obviously, revolutionizing things and what they're doing. It's very Shanahan-esque, except he yeah. does it a little bit more through the pass game and uses that as the jump-off point. Shanahan uses the run game. Certainly, Ben Johnson is going to be in that conversation mm. for me. Kevin O'Connell is definitely in that conversation for the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, come on. It doesn't matter who's playing quarterback. Guys are wide open running across the field, you know, every play. It's just, will the quarterback not do dumb things like Nick Mullins has done the last <laughs> two weeks, right? You know, and then I brought, after that, I, you know, McVay. McVay, I think those would be my top guys in football right now that I look at to go really creative, right? Have an attitude and a toughness about them. Know how to tie plays together. That's really important, too. And that's where those guys, not only the creativity and the guts to do things that are outside the box, but they understand how to, you know, when I say tie plays together, here's this run play. Here's this run play. Oh, it's a fake run. It's a play action. Oh, here's this run play. Oh, here's the fake run, the play action. Oh, and it's the screen off of it. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Oh, here's this run play. Okay. Here's this run play, the play action. They fake the screen over there and then they throw the screen over there. So they yep. give you so many looks for the same plays or give you the same look with a play that starts off looking the same. That's different. And that's where, to me, they're they're kind of special in that group. I remember Matt Lafleur telling me the most important thing Sean McVay taught him was the illusion of complexity. Exactly Everything right. Is very simple, but make sure it looks complicated so the defense thinks it's that something else is happening. That's a John Gruden is- line right there. That's what he used to say. All the, and we used to shift in motion. It was the illusion of complexity. Let's see if we can get the defense to communicate, mess up a check. Oh, no. Wait, you got this. Wait, what coverage were in? They just changed the formation. Yeah. Now we want to get another coverage, and now you get an advantage that way. And let me just say this because you brought up his name. Lafleur is on the cusp of being on that group as well, right? I think he had, had the training wheels on a little bit for Jordan Love, and he had a bend to Aaron Rodgers. But, like, you saw once they got a little more comfortable with Jordan Love this year, I mean, man, they've been explosive, and they do some cool things on offense. I think he's, like, on the cusp of being in that conversation as well. Completely agree. Um, Lamar Jackson is probably going to win the MVP as long as he doesn't have a uh, a, a game. I mean, it's almost like <laughs> everybody's getting eliminated the last month where, like, Dak has that game. We all think he's the MVP. Purdy has that game. I think as long as Lamar lands the plane here, he's probably going to be the MVP. Um, the difference in him this year is is what, Chris? Well, I think they're they're playing through the pass game offense, right? I think that's the big thing. That's why I think they're more dangerous than years past when they were, you know, were the one seed a few years back. You know, it was run game, run game, run game. They had play action pass, Lamar run game, play action pass, run game, run game, run game. And then they'd get in the playoffs and teams would be like, well, we're, we're a playoff team. We can stop this run a little bit. And there wasn't enough pass game ideas and creativity there for them to now go, oh, let's go to plan B. We'll still be okay. So, you know, M- Lamar is incredible in the pocket. I think that's the big thing. They got weapons around him, and they do have more answers in the pass game, let alone they can run the ball too. I think that's what's different. He does not look to run. 
you know, and that's slowly dissipated with each year. But this year, I think it's more than ever with him sliding, moving in the pocket, running towards the line of scrimmage, but still keeping the eyes down the field in case somebody comes up. That's where I think he's become really good. And like, you know, as I kind of said during some of our pregame stuff over the weekend, like the stats don't really tell the truth about right. Lamar Jackson, right? Think about the game the other night. That really encompasses what it is. You look at the game the other night and you go, the stats are good, but they're not mind blowing, right? But if you go back and think about every big moment in the game or, ooh, if the 49ers can get off the field here or do that or this, Lamar comes through. So to me, it's the big moment of the game moments that Lamar is special in. Or, you know, it's the capitalizing on, there's a lot of quarterbacks move the ball through the 20s and I put up good stats, but then they can't punch it in the end zone. Lamar can punch it in the end zone there too. So that's where he is special. He is in the lead, no doubt. I don't think it's over. I mean, okay. if Tyree Kill goes for 250 mm. this week or Ty Tua goes for two, you know, throws for 480 and four touchdowns, like, and then they win the AFC East and somehow end up the number one seed, I, you know, there's a place there. I also I go, agree. what if Lamar and Tua kind of underwhelm this week, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't play that good. And then let's say Josh Allen has another big game this week. Mm. And then he goes to Miami the week after that and puts on another show and beats the Dolphins and win the AFC East. Those are just some other avenues, I think, that, you know, we could be aware of here for the last two weeks of the season. I agree. You know, someone said this the other day, and I, I've been thinking about it ever since, that if the Ravens ran the tush push instead of giving Gus Edwards the ball at the one, the MVP race would have been over a month ago. It just, well, it just touchdown numbers. You know what I mean? It's yes. just like, it's it just so we, we don't, we don't trust our eyes enough as, as media. Agree. Lamar Jackson is amazing. He's doing all of this stuff. And then we say, well, you didn't have four touchdowns. Well, Ooh, I, I know that's yeah. what we got. to. You said that's the right phrase. Trust your eyes. This is where I'm trying to, I've been bound to, banging on the table all year for the most of the year until he got hurt a few weeks So going Tyree kills the MVP. Trust your eyes. Trust what we see every Sunday where we go. The most unbelievable thing we see is number 10 running around and making <laughs> the, the best athletes on our, in the planet look like they're less than, I mean, it's incredible. And then we see when he's not in the game, they're not as good. He comes back in the game. They drive down and score a touchdown. He comes back out of the game. They can't get a first down. I mean, so that's where you, there's too much stat reading in this conversation right now. And you're right. And that's where I've pushed back against Jalen Hurts, too. Jalen Hurts is incredibly overrated in that category. He doesn't run the ball as good as Josh Allen or, or Lamar Jackson. Uh, certainly not Justin Fields, but he's got the greatest offensive line and that we've seen in football since the nineties Cowboys to where, yeah, he gets these rushing touchdowns where I go, well, I mean, almost every quarterback in football would score in the touch pushes. It doesn't matter how much you squat. I mean, the best quarterback sneaker we saw before Brock Purdy was Tom Brady and he can't squat 70 pounds. So no, it doesn't <laughs> really matter. It's it's about the O line and all that, and that's where yeah, I, I I do push back against that a little bit. And you're exactly right; it's a good way to phrase it there with Lamar Jackson and all that. If we're if we're just doing the trust the eyes test for you, Hill is the most impressive player on tape this year. Yeah, uh, yes. If if I had to go through it, and you know the injury derailed things a little bit, but yeah, I think if I still had to make my vote at this second. Whew, it would be really tight between Tyreek Hill and Lamar. Like three weeks ago, mm -hmm. before that Tennessee Titans Monday night game, I would have been in no doubt about it. It's it's actually, I would have gone, it's Tyreek Hill and probably Christian McCaffrey is the number two. Because mm. again, back to the broad Purdy conversation where Tyreek Kill is the stir that straws the drink there in Miami. I, I believe that McCaffrey is the, the, the straw that stirs the drink for them. You know, yeah. everything is based around him in the offense. And that, to me, is the MVP, not necessarily the guy who benefits from all the great things the offense has to deliver, and it just gets made, uh, made easy for you. And, oh, I'm the quarterback, so give me the MVP while I'm at it. That's where I'm trying to push against that narrative a little bit. We've gotten too much into that. The Heisman and the MVP has basically become quarterback on the best team award, and that's just not what it. it used to be when we were growing up. Right. Tickets to the game, merch, meals at iconic restaurants, stays at Caesars Palace. All this can be yours when you bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Win or lose, every bet earns reward credits, which you can redeem across the empire. Now, if you haven't started yet, use the code OmahaFull, and then 
Place your first bet up to $1,250. If you win, great. You keep those winnings. But if you lose, you get your stake back as a bonus bet. Josh Allen, it was funny because I saw some, I, I love Josh Allen, as do you. Um, we're longtime Josh Allen fans here, even though I had some skepticism, certainly his first year. Um, but I saw some MVP talk the last couple of weeks, or maybe they're the most dangerous team. And you know, my feeling is, you know, they did just get their OC fired a month ago. Um, but I, do you believe in the kind of the narrative that this could be a really dangerous team? I always think that that's, I always think like, at this time of year, there's always teams like, well, nobody wants to play this team. And it's like, well, you know, nobody wants to play the one seed, typically the two seed. Yeah, it's right, never the right. seed. There's a reason the six seed and the seven seed or the six seed and the seven seed. Um, the Josh Allen we're seeing right now is how dangerous in the playoffs. Uh, extremely. You know, I think uh, like if you gave me two teams, right, that were out of the side, the top teams in football, yeah. right, towards the bottom of the, the playoff bracket. The Rams and the Bills would be the two yeah. teams that I would think most of the NFL is good. The top seeds would go, gosh, I don't want to play them in the first round, right? I mean, Buffalo, they're extremely well coached on defense. They got a deep defensive line, right? They can't play man to man, but McDermott's a master at creating awesome zones. So they are dangerous. Josh Allen, you know, I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know. He's one of the greatest talents we've ever seen in the history yeah. of football. He's one of the best players in the game. There's no doubt about it. And, and I mean, it's, it's, you know, like we talk about, it's, it's, it's all on him, you know, and, and I've tried to say this throughout the year. Cause there's some people on TV that want to blame it on Josh Allen. And I'm like, I, you're not, I don't know what you're watching. I really don't. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're watching. You need to question your intelligence or, and knowledge of football. If you don't think Josh Allen's one of the best players in the game. I mean, again, Gabe Davis, good game last week. The week before, it's zero yards. I mean, Gabe Davis is a number three receiver. And because he had a game against the Kansas City Chiefs four years ago in the divisional round, everybody's still trying to go, wait, he's that guy. And it's like, no, I got 70 other games that tell you he's not that guy. Get over it. Stephon Diggs is not a top five receiver in football, right? Top five receivers in football are people that can score from anywhere and do anything. Tell me the last time you saw Stephon Diggs catch a slant and run for 70 yards or a touchdown or do something where you went, wow, right? Not happening. He's borderline. I don't even know if he's top 10. The thing they did was James Cook, tougher run game, throw the ball more to the back out of the backfield. That's at least giving them something or a defense that they play against, something else to defend. And then you sprinkle in a Josh Allen run every now and then. And, of course, we know his talent in throwing the football. You know, only Mahomes can throw the football like Josh Allen. He's special. And, yeah, Buffalo's dangerous, definitely. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I, I do think they can make a big run in the AFC. Uh, agree. Um, we'll get you out of here on, on the two questions we ask everybody. First one, we call it badasses. Most badass person you were ever around in football. That could be at any level could be for any reason but i think we know the parameters here of what a badass means in football we got a lot of these guys on the back here i'm pointing who am i pointing to bruce smith who was dan marino's badass because boy bruce smith got after it when dan marino was on the field but typically it's a teammate you have the floor chris sims the biggest badass you've ever been around i've been i've been around some badasses okay <laughs> i mean i really have and i'm i'm gonna name a few just off the top yeah, please. here this is not easy i mean first off i grew up in a locker room with the ultimate badass and lawrence yes. taylor okay so you know that's that's pretty hard to the to top right there um, Absolutely. You know, even at Texas, I was around some badasses, maybe not, you know, totally famous to that level. Uh, but then you get into my NFL playing days. My first year in the NFL, I mean, I was on a defense with Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks, right? Simeon Rice, Rondé Barber, kind of badasses, definitely. Yep. Right? I go yep. to the Tennessee Titans. I was with Albert Hainsworth in his prime. Oh, he was the best defensive player in football, right? Yep. Cortland Finnegan, feisty Cortland, right? <laughs> Keith Bullock, at middle linebacker, badasses, like for real. I went to the Broncos and – was around Brandon Marshall, the receiver, who was a badass, like punished people. I was there with uh, Brian Dawkins on the team, Wolverine, right? So some special ones there. I completely agree. Wait, were you on the Broncos with Dominique Foxworth? I uh, Nope, I missed him. Oh. I, didn't, I, didn't, yeah, I didn't get that, but. If I was going to say, win. conspicuously absent from the badasses is Dominique Foxworth. Wow. Middle, just a podcast yeah, I, just, now. I just missed him. I think he left the year before I got there. Um, but, but regardless, 
I think if I had to narrow it down to badasses, it would be between Lawrence Taylor and Warren Sapp. And and I think I'd probably lean on Lawrence Taylor there with Sapp coming in, you know, in a close second. We've had Taylor before. Can you tell me a Warren Sapp story? Because I'm not sure I've gotten one from the NFL level. I've gotten a million Kane stories, but what's what's the Warren Sapp story that sticks out to you about badassery? Right. Well, so I'm going to have some fun with this conversation, right? Please. But, you know, like Warren Sapp, I was his rookie haze, basically, right? Uh-huh. Uh you know, at times he, he called me his road hoe. That's what he called me at times, right? So, so, and it was all in wow. it, it, good fun. And I know I'm going to probably say some things here that aren't ex- necessarily no, appropriate. That's all what time. we like here. That's what we yeah. like here. Okay. But yeah, he, I was his road hoe. And so my whole rookie year, I always had to have a can of skull on me at all times, right? So, because if he went, hey, Simmy, like across the locker room, I had to throw him a can of skull because he wanted to put some dip in and go to a meeting. And then, you know, hey, pads the locker room, of course, that for sure. But on the road, if we had a road game or anything at the hotel, I had to carry his bags. And I always had to carry his bags up to his bedroom and, and you know, leave them off there. And he'd throw a $20 bill on the ground usually for me. Like I was the bellhop. Like I was too proud to pick it up because I grew up in Phil Sin's house or something. I picked that $20 up every time. I said, I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, but those were – you know, some of my Warren Sapp stories. And of course there was some colorful language in there sure. to go along with it that I, that I won't, you know, add into the story, but uh, yeah, Sapp was, was quite the personality. Recent college graduate. I saw he's joining coach prime staff. So congratulations to, to Warren Sapp. Um, all right. Last, be awesome. yeah. Last thing um, we do this for everybody. One rep in your life, in your career of football that you could get back. What are you getting back? Oh, wow, man. Woo. I got two that come to my mind. Um, you know, I was a, the, a part of the, the first really Calvin Johnson rule, right? Mm-hmm. The, so we were playing the Washington Redskins at the time mm-hmm. in the playoffs. And I threw a ball, which I thought was going to tie the game late in the game. He caught it. He fell to his knees, right? And then as he fell into the ground, he lost control, so he didn't mm. complete the process, right? The very next play, we called a double move again, kind of aggressive play. It was like fourth and eight, and we went for it. And I got a little pressure on my left, and I could feel it coming down, and I want to make sure I got the ball off. That would be one that comes to mind because I feel like mm-hmm. if I just didn't feel the pressure, I was going to throw a strike and we were going to tie the game up again, even after that play. So there's that or mm-hmm. we're driving in the big 12 championship game, playing Colorado. We're in total control of the football game. And again, pressure in my face. I got a tight end running like a 12 yard out route and I'm going to have to throw it before he breaks out of the route. But I know he's about to be open. And I'm, I misjudged his mm. aggressiveness coming out of the break and it got intercepted and returned for a big return. And the game got flipped on its head to where if we win that game, we're going to go play Miami in the national championship. Instead, we lost. I think that would probably be the play I would go with. That play was not only cost a chance to win the national or go to the national championship, win the big 12 championship. That was my junior year. I was having teams tell me that I should come out early, that I was going to be a top 10 or 15 pick. I threw an interception there and then followed up with two more interceptions. And I stayed my ass in school after that. And knew I needed, <laughs> needed some work, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> this was amazing. Chris Sims, NBC Sports, co-host of PFT Live with our buddy Mike Florio and Unbutton with Chris Sims, one of my favorite football podcasts in the world. Thank you so much for coming. This is football, buddy. Anytime, Kevin. You the man. Talk to you soon, man.